I'm just going to continue on a little bit from uh, last week, and uh, I'm just going to pick up a few things that I said last week, just to uh, get me started here. I was talking about that the enemy wants to change the culture of the church, he wants to take us from uh, spiritual into social. And very much the church today has become a social event. But what we've got to understand is what God wants, how God wants to build his church. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hate will not prevail against it. God is very, very interested in the church. He says he watches over the sparrows. If he watches over the sparrows, how much more would he be watching over us? How much more would he be watching over his church? The vehicle that God wants to work through. The vehicle that God wants to speak through. The vehicle that God wants to demonstrate himself through. The vehicle that God wants to reveal himself through. And you won't pick it up on the, the press watching the news. All you pick up is the negatives of life. But the Bible says this in the book of Mark chapter 16. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. I think that that's a pretty powerful statement. You're either in or you're out. And what we're seeing a lot today, and we're claiming people as our brothers and sisters in God who are not. There is a form of godliness, there's a form of religiosity, and it's not the truth. You see, if we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we're saved. If we don't, we're condemned. Then he said, and these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Friend, that is the DNA of the church. That's who the church really is. And so the enemy comes and he tries to change our culture. He tries to change our belief system tries to change the way we do church. It's not a feel-good place. Sometimes in church, you'll feel like you've been kicked in the gut. Sometimes when you come to church, you'll feel like as if something's grabbed hold of something that's on the inside of you and squeezed it to a point where you can't bear it anymore. You see, it's God's purpose and it's God's plan to remove the leaven from our lives. Sometimes church isn't a fun place. Sometimes it's a factory where God starts to deal with people. You see, Jesus came to save the lost. It says in Luke 19, verse 20, Jesus came. You see, before I got saved, I was lost. There are beautiful people out there today that are not saved, they're lost. We can't, just because they're nice people, we can't say everything's okay. Because it's not. The Bible's very, very plain. Jesus came to save the world. Sin has a very negative effect on people. It destroys lives. Anybody here know anybody whose life has been destroyed? We see many. Destroys lives of many had great potential. Ends up hopeless, broken. Many a night, the pillow of mum and dad are wet with tears, crying for their children. The prodigal son had all the potential in the world, but sin got into his life. Greed, whatever you can say, whatever it might be. But I think that there's not one person in this room who are really honest with ourselves that haven't been affected by the ravage of sin. Where it hasn't at some time or other got a hold of us. Where it tries to come in and destroy our lives. God likens us as the fishermen. He said, I will make you fishers of men. I don't know about you, but I'm a fisherman. 
When you catch a fish, you have to clean it. It doesn't come wrapped with chips on the side. When you catch a fish, normally it needs cleaning. When you go to clean a fish, if it's dead, there's no reaction. But if it's still alive, there's a bit of a reaction. And you see, if we're really not dead to the flesh, when God starts to clean us, there'll be a reaction. And many times when that reaction comes, and I've heard a lot of people in my few years of ministry, where the Spirit of God is obviously on their lives and wanting desperately to help people through and break strongholds over people's lives. But they resist and they get angry and they walk away from God. And one of the tragedies, I guess, if I want to be real honest today, is that we all know of so many people that love God with all their heart, but that they are away from God. Is that true? Is it okay if I speak honestly today, or do you want me to tickle your ears? Because I want to tell you, we're not into that business here. It doesn't come all wrapped in, in nice table chips. Every human is valuable in God's sight. We need each other. We need somehow or other. And if I can say this, one of the tragedies in life is that when we walk away from the anointing, we take on the natural. And there's too many people running around who think they are God's little helpers that are trying to remove the speck out of other people's eyes and deny the log in their own eye. And I want to tell you, it's not just something to give me, it's a privilege to be able to minister to people, to be able to help them, to do it with love and compassion, knowing that the vessel on the other side that you're talking to is a person, but the person on this side, you, have got just as many problems as usual. I want to tell you there's many times that I've been counseling somebody when God's rebuked me and brought something up in my life that I had to deal with. Unfortunately, we're not perfect yet. Amen? How many people know that God's working on it? But I want to tell you there's something, there's something that will help you. And there's something there that will do more in your life than anything else. If you get a passion for God. If you have a desire to please God. Even though you fall, even though you might stumble, we will rise again and again. Out of the ashes, we will rise again. Yeah. And I believe that the church of the living God is going to be a force to be reckoned with. People need the church. I believe that we need each other to bring change. Because you see, we are the church. We are part of that church change from social back to spiritual. The disciples wanted to do much more than build the church. Unfortunately today it's a lot of things about numbers and all that and, and good on it. God doesn't mind numbers. He wrote a book and called it Numbers. I'm not trying to pull down anything like that but what is our priority? What is our focus? What, what turns us on? They want, just didn't want to build a church. They were asking God to empower them to move out and impact an entire culture. You see, some of the largest churches are not really impacting the way Jesus impacted the then known world. The way the disciples impacted the then known world. The Bible says that the people, the magistrates and all the religious leaders, they feared lest the message that they were preaching would touch the whole world. 
and they tried to stop it. Not because that they were they were just but because of the demonic power that was on the inside of that religious thing. That will try to stop the move of God or try to create something that is not God. But you see, I believe if we're going to see a move of God that's going to turn Australia right side up, the church has to be empowered again. It is not a social gospel. It is not a matter of getting your name on the sausage roll, I mean the church roll. It's more than that, I mean, it's getting your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's been born again, it's been led by the Spirit, it's allowed the Spirit of God to touch it. Church can become a social event, and I believe in social things. I believe in having a sausage sizzle, as long as it's not the main focus. I want to read uh, something that I read the other day, if I can find it. Might have lost it. Here it is. This was written by a guy by the name of William Law, an English writer. And he wrote this in the 1700s. Read whatever chapter of scripture you will, and be ever so delighted with it. Yet it will leave you as poor as empty and unchanged as it found you. Unless it has turned, unless it has turned you wholly and solely to the Spirit of God. And brought you into full union and dependence upon Him. Friend, unless the church really, you've got to understand what I'm saying here, truly repents and gets on its face and comes back to God, nothing will change. I believe that this hour that we're in, the church age that we're in, there's got to come a move of the Spirit. What is missing in the church, in my life, in the world, we are disconnected from the original vision. I want to just read some stuff here so that we can understand that when God created it, when God created us, when God started this whole thing, He had something on His mind. He wasn't just, had nothing to do one Sunday and said, well, let's build a billy coat and get a car and billy goat, perhaps He didn't build a lot of billy goats, and then have a game down the hill. No, He was deadly serious. He was talking about the kingdom. He was talking about what he was about. He wanted to build a church. He wanted to have a people. He wanted to have a family. And that's in, that is in every human. That when you get married and things like that, if, you know, if it's not the in-laws, it's the out-laws that are trying to tell you to have a baby. But it's, that's what's inside us to reproduce. And God wanted to reproduce. He wanted to have a family. And so he comes on the scene and the, the three women together, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And, and he said, and so God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over, the, uh, uh, sorry, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. Do you believe that you're created in the image of God? Do you believe today that God has given you authority? Do you believe that God wants you to have dominion? Do you believe, well, why do you allow some hairy legged whoop whoop run all over you? Why do you allow things to happen that should never happen? But you see, if we just sort of turn the other cheek, or if we just, oh well, praise the Lord. No, we're going to stand and fight. If ever there's a time for the church to stand and fight, it has to be now. Amen? Because we're seeing stuff that's going on that is so stupid. You know what? We look at what's happened in New Zealand there the other day. One man rises up and he does something stupid. I'm not condoning what he did. I'm not saying what he did was right or anything like that. But all of a sudden, everybody's saying, Paul Muslim, Paul Muslim, Paul Muslim. Do you know that when the ISIS there, when they removed, they pushed those people back, that the, the armed troops of America and then whoever it was, 
they found 200 women that had had their heads taken off. 860 uh, deaths caused by Muslim people in the last year alone and nothing said. But I'll tell you, we can't just accept them and fall into the trap of the enemy. I don't condone what happened. It was wrong. It was very, very wrong. A guy gets an uh, egg snapped on his head. The stupid things that he said was wrong. Okay. But he got, I, I don't know what you would have done. Somebody would have whacked you in the head with an egg. But all of a sudden now he's a criminal. But the young fellow got let off with nothing. See, we've got, we've got strange rules all of a sudden. Strange. There's no justice. There's no justice in this world today. And we call them what is good, as the Romans said, bad, what is bad and good. There's an enemy out there that wants to destroy us. And we can't embrace the enemy. We've got to understand that God wants the church to rise up and be strong and be counted in this hour that we're living in. If, if, you, if you don't, we won't push back the darkness and then darkness will overshadow us. Please don't misunderstand me. I don't agree with what happened the other week. But the, but the result of what happened the other week has gone crazy. These people wanting to impact the entire culture. We've been disconnected from the original vision. God wants to have a people that have authority, have dominion. For this purpose was the Son of God made manifest. He said, I will, and he said, and I will build my church. Because I'm going to destroy the works of Satan. The ravage of sin is not pleasant. We hear of its effects, drugs, rapes, murders, pedophiles, abuse, all done by mankind. But what we've got to understand is this. People that have done these things, when they truly repent and get saved and sin is removed from their lives, those people can become pillars in the house of God. Amen. See, we've got to take the leaven out. We've got to be able to remove the stuff that's not right. We've got to be able to be, we've got to, political correctness is not for us. Amen. Amen. We've got to be able to say what needs to be said. I believe until the church says stop, nothing will change. I believe this. I believe it's time to get serious. You like that word? Yeah. You people have proved today that you're serious. You proved to me today that you're serious. I didn't want to go on this morning. <laughs> uh, I said I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but you proved to me today that it doesn't matter whether it's hard or what, you just want God, amen. And we put up with a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but I'm not gonna put up with the devil, amen. I'll put up with a bit of natural stuff, but I'm not gonna put up with the devil. Don't want to put up with him. It's time to get serious. What's going to happen when there's no more dollar? When there's no more pension? When there's no more free medical? What are we going to cling to? What are we going to run to? The Bible speaks about building a house upon the rock. Building a life upon him. Father, I ask you today that you will open our eyes. How many people come on? Lift up your hearts, lift up your hands. Father, lift. I ask you today that you will open our eyes to the present circumstance and situation that we are in right now. Father, help us to, to have our eyes open. Lord, that we will not be ignorant and not be unaware, but Lord, that we would know the hour that we live in, we need to get serious about you, Lord. We need to get serious about what you say. And it is a time for us, the church, to rise up and speak with boldness and with authority 
and declared the kingdom of God. My God, that the enemy's plan will be wrought. The enemy's plan will be snatched. And the kingdom of God will be revealed. And the kingdom of God will flourish. And it will overtake. And, and it will conquer in Jesus' name. You see, we sing that song. And, and, and I love that song. I can't remember the name of it right now. I can't even remember the word. Yes, I can. Uh, raise the hallelujah. I've got the list in front of me. Now, the words of that song are so powerful. But friend, I want to tell you, God's not just looking for a choir. To hallelujah. Obviously, you're not looking for me. That's what you're <laughs> He's looking for a bunch of people that will believe what he says. That out of the ashes we will arise. Amen. God is fighting for us. Pushing back the strongholds. Smashing down the enemy's plan. Because God's got a greater plan. He said, I will build my church. But he said, let us build man in our image and in our likeness. Let us have a family that has authority. That are going to be victorious. They're going to rule and reign over every demonic force. They're going to rule and reign over every situation. They will triumph over the power of the enemy. They will be my kids. Hallelujah. Jesus stood in the boat and he said to the wind and the sea, Be still! And then he said to us, These things that I do, you can do also. I've heard many of these people with farms or whatever it might be that have seen a storm coming towards them, raging, ravishing, devouring, wanting to destroy. And somehow or other, a little woman or a little man have held their hands and they've looked at the massive storm. And in the sight of humanity and in the sight of the natural thing, they look so insignificant to what that storm is. We saw a picture of a storm coming over the church in where? Bow Desert, massive cloud. And it would have looked ravishing and raging. But a little man and a little woman there standing up and looking at that thing and say, Stop! In the name of the Lord, stop! And they said, oh, how many people have heard these testimonies? Come on. Have you been asleep? Where have you been? Where have you been? You know, we've heard it. And, this, and the thing splits and goes one way and goes the other way. And because God has given us authority. He's given us power. He's given us victory. He's given us everything we need. There's so much that God has promised in His Word that has been lost to interpretation. Oh, God didn't really mean that. Unbelief. Wrong teaching. And no revelation. Friend, yeah. we need Holy Ghost teachers like never before. Amen? We need revelation. Amen? Amen. Anybody here need a revelation? Come on, we need revelation. We, we need good teaching. We, we need to break unbelief from our minds. We, we, we need an interpretation of what God says He's going to do. Yeah. The disciples did not believe Mary Magdalene. They were so, so caught up in grief and what they could see in the natural, they didn't even inquire. You know, one of the things with church culture today really doesn't even inquire about the things of the Spirit. Because in their mind, it's offensive. In their minds, it might cause trouble. But let's just put that aside. And let's do this because we're seeing this. They didn't see it. They couldn't see it. I want you to have a look at your Bibles if you would. I've got a few minutes here. Don't finish it today, I'll finish it next week. Luke chapter 10. <coughs> These are the same disciples. I want you to. These disciples that. When Mary Magdalene came and the others came and they said, 
We went to the grave, they rolled the stone away, the stone was rolled away, and he wasn't there, but he's risen, he's alive. The angels spoke to us, this is what happened, they didn't believe. But listen, you see, you, you might be excited today, but you've got to keep getting excited, amen? You might, you might get excited one Sunday morning, but I'm going to tell you, you've got to stay excited Monday. You've got to stay excited Tuesday. You've got to stay excited Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and come back Sunday excited. <coughs> it's not an hour or two hour session that we have where we get excited and get all halati dadi and praising the Lord and then go home and allow the enemy to ravish us. And here are these guys, not long before, when the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, nevertheless, do not don't rejoice in that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Here they are. They come back and they say, Hey, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us in your name. He said, I know, I know that, but I want you to know something else. I give you the authority. You can rejoice in that, but I will tell you, as sure as we made little apples up here, the enemy's going to come, he's going to try to rob, kill, and destroy the faith that you have in me. And I want you to know that when he comes, when he comes, when he comes, you have authority over him. Friends, if there's something, a revelation that the church needs to understand again, is that God has given us authority over the works of the enemy. Over the serpents and the scorpions and over all the works of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. In Luke 24, just come over there with me for a little minute. Luke 24. See, he just didn't speak uh, these things to the, to the twelve. He spoke to the seventy. That there was a multitude of people that understood. And when Mary and them came to, the, to, to, to anoint the body of Jesus, and the angel started to speak to them, you see, I, I'm, I'm picturing this in my office the other day, and I, I'm watching the girls. They've got the spices. They've got everything like that, and they're walking up towards what I would imagine in their minds would have been impossibility because the day or a couple of days before they saw that massive stone being rolled across the grave. True? But here they are. And this is what I want to say to you today. Well, besides other things. <laughs> the task may seem impossible, but if we don't take a step towards it, it will never happen. If the enemy can defeat us, Sitting in the lounge chair where we don't get up, we're done. But if by the Spirit of God we can get up off that lounge chair and start to walk towards it, I'm going to tell you the job will get done. So what are they doing? They're, they're heading off towards this thing that the great, in their mind, there's, I think there's a couple where it says, who's going to roll the stone away? How's this going to happen? What's going to happen here? How's this? When they get there, to their surprise, the stone is already rolled away. They walk in there, they find an angel, and, they, and an angel starts to speak to them. They, they say, what have you done with my Lord? What have you done? What have you, what have you done with him? Where have you taken him? And they said, did he not tell you? See, church, this is the thing that we, did he not tell us? Did he ever say to you, you're going to be buffeted and you're going to be smashed and you're going to do this and you're going to fail and the devil's going to triumph over you and the church is going to get lost and the devil's going to rule and reign and uh, that, that, that. No, he never ever said that. Anybody else? 
Yeah. Are you catching my drift here? Don't you remember? Don't you remember what he said to you? Don't you remember how they quoted it? And all of a sudden they remembered? Oh, oh, oh. This is where I believe the church is at. She's going to rise up out of the ashes because the Holy Ghost is going to bring back to our remembrance the things that God has spoken to us. Amen. He's going to bring back. And when the enemy comes and you feel like you're a failure, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you the Spirit of God is going to speak to you and say, No, 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 by the hair of my chinny chin chin, you are not a failure. You are more than a conqueror. Rise up, you people of power. Rise up, you mighty champions. Rise up and take him on. He's a wimp. The disciples didn't believe. They even said they're idle tales. Idle tales. Only believe all things are possible, friends. There was Mary Magdalene, Joanna Mary, the mother of James and other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. Verse 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus. See, one of my problems is when I read something like that, I stop and I start, where were they coming? Where were they coming? What were they doing? These are the people there that were you know, with Jesus, and these are the ones that have seen the miracles of Israel. And all of a sudden now, where are they going? You can ask yourself, where are they going? They're heading down the road. In other words, hopelessness is all around them. It didn't work. It didn't happen. And here they are, and while they're walking down the road, uh, well, Elias, which is seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talk together of all the things that had happened. So it was, so it was, while they were conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with him. For that second It doesn't matter where you're heading when Jesus starts coming beside you. Amen. He's got his eyes on the sparrow, he's got his eyes on us too, amen. And here are these two blokes walking down the road. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, not seven miles. <laughs> All this. And, and here they are. And Jesus comes alongside of them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Unbelief will stop you from seeing Jesus. You mean not at least with it. Unbelief will stop us from seeing Jesus. Getting caught up with what's going on, disappointment will stop us from seeing Jesus. And he said, <laughs> no, not this. What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? And one, his name was Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger? <laughs> Come on, this is a church. This is a church talking to Jesus. Jesus turns up, they don't see him. They don't see him. They're sad. They're so sad. They're so sad. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? 
And have you not known the things which happened there this day? And he said to them, what then? Tell you what, you think heaven's just God sitting on a cloud playing a harp? I've got some news for you, amen. What things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in thee, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. He drop kicks, that's what he was doing. <laughs> he was playing the price. Indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since things happened. And certainly it goes on. And it says that the words that they spoke astonished them. Friend, you can read the scriptures. You can read it, and that's going to leave us just as empty. You can come to church, and it can leave you just as empty if we don't embrace, if we don't take hold. I'm not here today just saying things that you can triumph, that you can be overcoming, that you can be successful to astonish you. I'm wanting us to rise up, amen. Does that mean we'll never have another fight? That doesn't mean that at all. It just knows, it just means that you win. It just means that you know you can win because you know, you know, because you know. Then he says, oh, foolish ones, just love hard and went on and on. And with the beginning of Moses and the prophecy expounded the words. When they drew near to the village where they were going, he indicated that he would have gone further. This is really the where I wanted to get to. Jesus comes and attaches himself. They couldn't see him. He expounded things, he did things. Later on it says that while he was talking to them, their hearts and their something burned. See, the Holy Ghost was getting around, stirring them, stirring them, moving on. And Jesus was walking with them, and as he's walking down the road with them, they're just about at their village. Uh, I guess the, the village, there was a detour off that road into the village, and Jesus indicated that he was going to move on. He was just going to continue to go on. But something there that the church has got to grab, they constrain him. Yeah. They've got to hold him. They've got to hold him. And they say, will you come with us? Don't leave me. Don't, ever, don't leave us. Will you come? Will you come with us? Will you come with us? See, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He's not talking to the world, he's talking to the church. God has knocked on our doors many times, we've opened many times, and we've got to continue to open the door, amen? Just because he knocked once doesn't mean he'll never knock again. Because he wants to take us deeper and further and to wherever he wants us to go. They constrain him, they said, don't, don't go, don't, don't go. Let me just read it so I can get it. And he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. Church, if there's one cry, I want to hear from this group of people. Jesus, will you abide with us? Will you come? Will you come? Will you come? Why don't you lift your hands right now? Will you come? Will you abide with us? Will you come? Will you come? Will you abide with us? Will you come? No, no, don't leave us. Don't leave us. Don't leave us. Don't leave us. You see, that is, the, that is the entrance. 
That is, that is not it. It's not enough just to, to do that. You see, when we invite Him in, then He will reveal Himself to us in a measure that we've never known before. See, what I'm talking about, the church has got to rise up and it will rise because there's a visitation of God. God's going to come. He's going to draw close to us. He's going to move. He's going to do this. Abide with us. For it is towards evening, and the day is fast spent, and he went to stay with them. And it came to pass, as he sat on the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it, and gave it to them, and their eyes were open, and they knew him. We would recognize Jesus when he draws me. We would recognize the next move of God. That will be unleashed by the Holy Spirit. Or will we just let it pass? Or will we embrace it? Will we embrace it? Still don't know what I'm going to call it. Father, I thank you right now. I thank you for this people that have put up with this long winded preaching. And this beautiful oasis. But Father, I just pray today that by your spirit you speak to us. Lord, we wouldn't let you pass us by. Lord, we're restrained. Lord, as you're walking through, knocking on doors, as you're walking through, touching people, looking for a people, oh God, would you come? Would you come again? Would you come in your power? Would you come in your power? Lord, I remember the days when we started the church of Walmart. The power of the anointing people being touched, move of God. And Lord, I believe that you want to just explode even greater and deeper and more. Lord, our eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Our eyes have seen you move by your spirit, but Lord, we hunger. Lord, would you stir a hunger inside us? Lord? Would you stir a hunger, a hunger? And we'll just give you all the praise and we'll give you all the glory. Jesus. Thank you.